Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me here to present today. I am Sparklezilla or Lindsay Whittle or future Lindsay. And I'm very excited to be presenting my work to all of you today. Uh, I often tell people that my primary mediums are collaboration and color. I also frequently work in performance or time-based work, garment, textile design, and education. I have broken down this talk into five chapters. I am trying to tailor this conversation to where my head is at um, with my work presently. Uh, and the chapter slides feature illustrations of my work by my husband, Clint Basinger. I've been, <clears throat> so this first chapter is um, surface body and duration. I have been using what I wear as a way to sketch ideas and bring my art concepts out of art spaces and into my daily life since 2004, <laughs> believe it or not. And I've been documenting it since 2009. <clears throat> um, the largest, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the largest image example on this slide is sort of my present um, explorations on this. This is a large wall collage of my documentation of this project from 2009 to 2018 that I did for an exhibition at the Carnegie Gallery in Covington, Kentucky. Another way that I think about surface and body and documentation is how I make digital collages of my work ideas and performances that happen in a moment of time. And then I do this to process the work and sort of keep my art archive alive uh, visually on my mind and through conversations about the collages. And then I refer to this project, these um, digital collages as my print language and it exists the most through the textile prints that I, um, that I wear and I sell, but I've also created installations and sculptures by laminating these collages on windows and illuminated plexiglass. And then lastly, my last example of surface body and documentation is my wedding dress project. I make a new wedding dress every year to try to take a stab at that best dress of my life. It is also a moment to recommit to my marriage and share how we have shifted our interests and in visual communication. The limo image is the first dress I wore to the original wedding ceremony and the most recent dress is on the bottom right. The so chapter two, transitioning connection to teamwork. From 2014 to 2019, the concept that primarily drove my work is the idea of connection. Um, this image is interlocking slotted plexiglass that can build up and change. I see my work as a vehicle to connect, to connect myself to other people and other artists, to connect people to my work and to connect people to each other. Uh, this is an installation buildup of hook and loop tape, tape pieces, uh, otherwise known as Velcro. As you can see in this piece, which is welded metal and magnets and the previous pieces, I pick materials that emphasize my primary concept. So I had this really big show in 2019 called Archive is Action at the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center. And in a lot of ways that show kind of felt like some punctuation on ideas. So during and after this show, I started to shift my thinking from connection towards teamwork, which I define teamwork as connection towards a goal. So I have two teamwork examples. Um, this piece was a giant choir robe that I, um, that I developed from a conversation with my friend Annie. And I invited my friend Steve Kempel to write an eight person uh, choir robe song, uh, sorry, eight person chamber choir song. And he developed the lyrics by hypnotizing four of my students <laughs> who were looking at that piece that's being projected behind the choir. And we invited a professional choir to come and sing and interpret the piece and also interpret the robe. Um, so, so many minds came together to make this piece exist. Um, the second example, my husband and I reenacted our wedding. So my husband and I got married in 2014 uh, in the format of kind of an art happening at the same museum that I later had that show in, in 2019. So we saw the space as an artifact of performance. So we revisited the original performances and invited new people to perform. Um, I changed into all my wedding dresses throughout the night. And again, so many minds were involved in making this piece happen. So this leads me to chapter three, <laughs> which is based on uh, it's understanding the elephant. And, um, this is based on a Hindu parable where three blind men 
approach an elephant and one grabs the trunk and thinks the elephant is a snake, <laughs> excuse me, and one grabs the ear and thinks the elephant is a bird and one grabs the leg and thinks that the elephant is a big tree. So individually, they don't really know what an elephant is, but together they're starting to gain a bigger understanding of an elephant. And this is sort of the biggest way that I approach art making. So <laughs> bear with me here. With this train of thought um, and thinking about collaboration as a medium, I call the foundation of my current work, my shape languages. And that's essentially uh, collaborator prompts that inform the choices in my work. So I currently have 21 different languages, which are with 21 different people. Um, and those are in different stages right now. So this is the list, which you see here, just to name a few. Um, Sky Kubaku is the language of 40 shapes and chainmail. Bowtie Enterprises Venture Capital is the language of questions. My husband's the language of mirroring. Um, so that's just to name a few. So this is inviting other minds to be actively part of my work. And I develop languages around these prompts. These honor, uh, these languages honor the different collaborators, their place in my thoughts and in my work. It allows me to be transparent in how many people it takes to make my work. Um, it allows me to explore the history and expand my idea of what shapes are in my work. Um, these languages challenge me to think bigger and they push me. And the people that I invite to create these shape languages with are people that I frequently collaborate with and or ask for advice in my work. So I'm gonna show you two examples. Um, so going back to the choir piece, uh, an example of a shape language that I have with my friend Steve, I took my favorite pages from his choir score, I cut out the negative space, and I scanned those shapes, and I derived the palette from the, from the choir robe itself, from the images from it. Um, and so when I need a 2D shape for my work, I might pull from, from this or some of the other shape languages that I have. So this one's kind of a literal 2D shape language. Um, there's some that are a lot more conceptual. <laughs> Um, this is my a shape language with my friend Lorraine. Her language is the language of architecture and 3D shapes. And I didn't even know that I think in 2D shapes until she gave me this challenge. So, um, so these sketches are, I took some stills from a video collage she made of my work and I did some non-objective drawings from those stills. And now I've been exploring on how to sketch, like turn these non-objective 2D shapes into 3D sketches. So there's a, um, a 3D print and the top right is actually, I was exploring whittling because my last name is Whittle. I felt like I needed to try it. And then uh, this last shape language example is with Benjamin Cook, who is a painter and a vexillologist who uh, that's the study of flags. And we were both interested in how flags um, like communicate and connect communities. So this is a this these images are a recent installation from last November. It's still kind of fresh on Ben and I's minds. And this is actually the the project I think I'm going to dig the hardest into this summer is this this flag language I have with Ben. So chapter four, a more extreme version of myself. <laughs> Um, so this is a list I made when I was uh, at the end of that that 2019 year where I'd had this big show and I've been working on a lot of work. Um, so I made this list of, that's sort of the recipe that makes up who I am, and I tried to brainstorm how I could push all of these different elements and develop a more extreme version of myself. So the first item that I've really tackled is the first item on the list, and that is I am tall. I'm six foot one, um, and that's the only one I've started to kind of deeply explore so far. Um, so I've always been tall and it's just a part of my reality and how I engage with people. And in 2021, I developed this three part performance that I call the super tall obstacle course. Um, this can only be completed with another person. I, um, and this version is me and my husband performing it. And there are different experiments that, um, use props and objects to make myself and my husband, um, taller. And this, it was interesting because it was reacting to that list, but it also became a way for me to dig into some struggles I had been having with mental health. I lost a lot of loved ones in 2020 and 2021, and super tall was kind of a way for me to become taller when I felt so small um, internally. Um, these are just two other variations of the super tall obstacle course that I tried last year. This is super tall installed and um, I'm used, I'm still like working through these ideas of all the different ways I can be taller, like through shoes and hats and things like that. 
And then in reaction to my husband's persona, future Clint, I created future Lindsay, which, um, and this was, I didn't create it in reaction to the list, but I think she's really connected to the list. So in a lot of ways, future Lindsay um, is an idealized character that's a more extreme version of myself. And my husband and I um, have created a sound art future band called Spacal for Now, where we use these personas to build live sound collages. Lastly, chapter five, <laughs> um, so exchanging ideas. I've recently come to the realization that exchanging information through art and teaching is a huge part of my practice. These are two different projects. Um, the left is called Otherworldly, the right is Communal Hat. These projects were led by me where I guided youth through art ideas and we created incredible multimedia time-based experiences together. Uh, these projects could not have existed without putting a lot of minds together, and we were sort of all the teacher and all the student, and these projects have hugely impacted me, and I'm often chasing after the experience of them as a teacher into all my, I bring that into all my classes. My husband and I run a small gallery called Peak uh, with local artists Annie Brown and Noelle McCarthy. Um, this is a still from a 24-hour performance festival we put together called Performathon in 2019. Um, so we try to use Peak as a way to facilitate amazing art experiences and connect our art community together. And I just feel like that's another example of exchanging information. So I think um, my influences are another way that I exchange, uh, that an exchange of information happens in my work. So I'm, I'm super interested in Mr. Rogers <laughs> and his approach to sharing information in a way that's grounded in support and care. Uh, the middle image is Nick Cave doing a sound suit performance. I had always admired and studied Nick's work, but later he became my advisor in grad school and that sort of cemented a major place as a mentor and influence in my work. I've recently been very influenced by Linda Montano's uh, performances and rituals. Um, she's the colorful portrait on the right. And her book, Interviewing Performance Artists from the 80s is on my reading list during this residency. And then when I was nine, I actually wrote a letter to Mother Teresa for a school project, and she wrote me back, which was really impactful to a nine-year-old. So ever since I've been really curious about her, and I read a lot of books about her life and character and the sort of precepts that governed her choices. Um, my husband is the gentleman in the suit with his hands up. Um, I've mentioned him a lot, obviously. So I was a huge fan of his art before I knew his character. And I make a lot of art about our marriage and we make a lot of art together as a team. So a major aspect to him and his work is to take the simplest moments in life and elevate them to give them heart. And I feel like that's an idea that I think a lot about. And it, I also think it connects to my interest in the Fluxus group. And I feel like the Fluxus group kind of opened a door to the idea that any moment in life can be shifted into an art experience. Um, so lastly, I'll mention the Fluxus group on the left and John Cage and Merce Cunningham on the right. Um, so they're probably the, that those two things are probably the biggest influence on myself and my work right now. Uh, the Fluxus artists I'm particularly focusing on in research are Dick Higgins, Allison Knowles, Benjamin Patterson, George Bretsch, and Alan Caprow in the Rudger 8. I've taken on John Cage as a research project <laughs> since 2016 due to his immeasurable um, influence on modern artists and movements through his class at the new school. Um, so the research kind of sends me in a lot of directions as you can see in this mind map that I made. I mean, it's, it takes me from the Bauhaus to Black Mountain College to Duchamp. Um, you know, he traveled extensively. So there's just a lot to dig into. And I think that's what kind of led me into the Fluxus group. So I'm going to uh, leave you with this thank you piece by Peter Frank. Uh, it's a Fluxus prompt. Uh, so thank you for your time. I'm going to say thank you 15 times. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.